Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the people and places that contribute to the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Dambach. On this edition, we'll hear the story of the Sandy Lake tragedy, meet some talented North Dakota artists, and enjoy a bluegrass Americana band with some amazing harmonies. As World War II raged in Europe and the Pacific, the war years changed life on the prairies in ways we can now hardly imagine. Although no battles were fought in North America, every citizen participated in the war effort. The Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County tells the story of what life was like here on the home front. Washington in wartime is people, busy people who pass through these gates in a never-ending stream. Important people, little people, humble people, young and old, all determined to give their best in our nation's hour of peril. It's hard for us to understand the impact that the war had on everybody's life every single day. Here in Clay County, there were something like 3,000 people went into service, uh, 3,000 men and women out of a population of 25,000. That's a lot of people gone off to service. And everybody else that remained behind, they wanted desperately to do something at home. But no matter what the cost, the American people are prepared to pay the price of victory. Rationing probably was the thing on the home front that affected people the most. Sugar was the first thing that was rationed and book number one had um, not very many coupons in it and, and it was for coffee and sugar. Then after each subsequent um, ration book was issued, the canned vegetables and fruits were rationed, canned meats were rationed, rubber was rationed. They obviously needed gas and building materials, so all of those things were rationed. Most people pitched in and wanted to feel like they were doing something to help America win this world war. The rationing system really worked. Every crop needed to win the war will be produced in enormous quantities as a result of the planning and research centered here. During World War II, farming took a lot more muscle power, and all that muscle was away during the war. In October of 1942, there was an early frost that was threatening to destroy the crops and we needed as many people out there as, as possible. So luckily, we're a college town. Moorhead State Teachers College, which is uh, Minnesota State University, Moorhead today, they declared an onion holiday. Classes were canceled and everyone was encouraged to go out and pick the fields, uh, sugar beets, onions, uh, to save it from being, uh, from being destroyed. Uh, 238 MSUM students uh, went out and worked in the fields for those days. Uh, that's half the student body. For the rest of the war, they were proud of, of that. The holders, rallying to the call for more food, joined the growing army of Victory Gardner. We needed to bump up the food production, so the government said, please, pretty please, can you turn your yard into a garden? Victory gardening was a way to feed your own family so that the farmers can send the wheat and the commercial crop overseas. It was really successful. In 1943, one in three uh, vegetables grown in this country that year were grown in somebody's yard. I want to report about another great American army, enrolling one in every four Americans. Boys and girls collect scraps to build up our national stockpile. Scrap drives were, were one place where rural parts of the country like ours really shined. Uh, New York City, Los Angeles, they can't touch the amount of rusty old metal that can be produced out here in the country. One day in Holly, they let all the kids out of school and all the businesses closed down. And in one day, they collected uh, almost half a million pounds of scrap. But with our country in peril, the women of America rallied to the support of their men. These mothers, wives, and sweethearts came to stand shoulder to shoulder with them in almost every capacity. 
Here in Clay County, we didn't have Rosie the Riveter, we had Rosie the Egg Cracker. You know, we weren't making munitions or tanks over here, but we were feeding the world. Well, Fairmont Creamery is one of the industries in locally that greatly expanded during the war. They added in February 1942 an egg dehydrating plant. Dried eggs could be kept for years, really, without refrigeration and uh, could be reconstituted with a little bit of water and uh, scrambled. My dad was in the South Pacific during the Second World War and he despised them, he just hated them. But uh, they did keep and uh, uh, they were a successful product for, for Fairmont. Uh, they hired 100 young women to crack eggs, essentially. Uh, each one of these gals on an eight-hour shift would crack uh, 164 eggs an hour. That's half a million eggs every single day went through that plant. That would be the equivalent of just about every egg produced within 50 miles of Fargo-Moorhead during the war. But Washington in wartime is people, people intent on contributing their personal effort. The most common way for people in Clay County to participate in the war effort was by volunteering with the Red Cross. Um, regularly to just go to the Moorhead City Hall, they rolled bandages. And we're now talking about like plastic band-aids, we're talking about long white sheets. Another thing that the Red Cross did was prepare care packages for prisoners of war. So these care packages would usually be filled with food, sometimes you'll get a book or even art supplies. And we have a uh, letter home, uh, written home by a, a paratrooper who was from Holly. He writes home to his wife, I want you to give $10 to the American Red Cross. If, if they ask why, tell them I'm in Germany and, and I know how much they're doing for us over here. 28 nations stand united until victory is won. Let us march toward the clean world our hands can make. I think what's fascinating about history is putting yourself in the shoes of the people that are living there. What would you be doing? Could I handle coffee rationing? If rationed coffee works out to about six cups a week, I had that this morning. In this exhibit, when you get the school groups in here, uh, one of the first things I ask them is, are we at war today? And almost all of them will say no, uh, unless you have a family member, someone you love in Afghanistan or Iraq. The war just doesn't touch you. And what this exhibit is really about how if you lived here, your family was incredibly affected by, by World War II. In the winter of 1850, the Bureau of India Affairs decided to relocate the Ojibwe out of Wisconsin and west of the Mississippi. Sandy Lake, Minnesota was an isolated temporary location with inadequate conditions and few supplies. The result was the loss of almost 400 Ojibwe men who died of disease, starvation, and frostbite. Against black and sky, wet feathers cannot fly. 
The North Dakota Council on the Arts is an organization that promotes the arts in North Dakota. They work with a variety of artists, ranging from musical and literary to visual and cultural. Here's a look at a few of the talented artists who reside in the great state of North Dakota. Arts and culture help define what it is that we are here in North Dakota. Now as a young girl I dreamed of the water engulfing these Midwestern plains. So having um, arts programming within this rural area is so important. It's important not only to the artists but to the people that are here. Just because we live in a rural area doesn't mean that we don't deserve wonderful cultural programs. The Council on the Arts provides funding for people like me to get my music out to the public. Well, I grew up doing music here in Western North Dakota. Being a rural musician can have its challenges and was always told that you should go on and go to Nashville, move out of this place and go on and, and do something with your music and somewhere else as if that meant that you were on some level a different sort of success. But I always had such a tie to this area, singing about what it was like to grow up out here, that it was always important for me to keep that sense of place but also really important for me to move back here because I wanted to be here and figure out a way to make music here and be a successful musician in the place where I wanted to live, where my family is, where my roots are. Red Door Art Gallery is an uh, economic engine for downtown Wahpeton. Since it started, we've had lots of special events and it's been an anchor for downtown. It's center for our historical and cultural district. It's spurred a lot of interest in other activities in Wahpeton. It's brought a lot of federal funding into our city. We've got National Endowment of the Arts grant funding that have supported murals and, and other projects in, in Wahpeton. Prairie Rose Carousel is one of 150 restored antique carousels in, in the country. It annually gets about 20,000 riders a year, and its renovation was done completely by local artists. I think arts encourage creativity and support entrepreneurs. It needs to be a hub for young people who want to live here. It also supports downtown apartments and, and people who live here that can be stable sources for businesses up and down Main Street. We never really know what's coming up next when it comes to 
what our students need to be prepared for and the creativity that we get out of the students when they don't feel like there's defined measure. They don't have to have the right answer, but they do have to support why they did what they did. They still have to say, well, I did this because, and that's, that's a really important skill. I've been really involved in the Arts Council. My first step was participating in a SALT team on my first year of teaching, and now it's become a STEAM team. It's professional development for your program, specifically for teachers. The other thing that got me going was teacher incentive grants. I wrote three teacher incentive grants to get supplies into my classroom so that my students could use the high quality watercolors and brushes that we wouldn't have otherwise. In 2009 we became a part of Art for Life and consecutive artists have come several years. They have uh, noticed an increase in how the residents respond when they come. At first they complained they couldn't do things and now they are doing original projects. Today we're working with third graders and this is a new component. The third graders are coming monthly to interact with residents, maybe eventually sharing stories and becoming pen pals and having a special resident that's here. There's definitely a positive demeanor and if an artist is staying in Langdon, then they spend quite a bit of time here and they paint or do something and the residents just flock around them and interact and tell stories. So it definitely adds a healthy aspect to their day. Over the years I've had the opportunity to uh, share some of our cultural stories here in this very Earth Lodge. But as a storyteller, it's also good to share our stories with those people uh, outside of our community and outside of our state. And the Cards Council has been generous in their gifting of the funds to help myself and several others as we travel around North Dakota, as we travel across our state, even overseas. The young people that uh, now who have been inspired by what they've learned in our classes from flute making and singing. It's really good what the Arts Council can do to help other people. As far as myself and my family, it's been a blessing. Long ago, they had to come to the storyteller and to the lodges like this or to a home. Uh, now, with the Arts Council, I get to go to their lodges, I go to their schools, I go to their communities. We're still welcoming the pilgrims to this land from all over the world and the Arts Council helps us to uh, open those doors and to make it a lot easier to understand other people. Wild Hands is a bluegrass Americana band from Minot, North Dakota. Their original music has amazing harmonies and heartfelt lyrics which is why their popularity is soaring. Sit back and listen to the talent of Wild Hands. Close your eyes, it doesn't have to seem so far And I see you when I see you I hope it's sooner than it's later You're never miles away from my heart You're miles away in a city you don't hate There's millions the people between I see and I see you when I see you don't think of miles as a dagger you're never miles away from my street If that airplane is failing and 
the ship in just a sailing. I'll buy a ticket, write the best song in New Orleans. I'll buy a ticket, write the best song in New Orleans. I'll buy a ticket, write the best song in New Orleans. If I had myself a dollar bill For every time you curse my name I might just become that rich man Head out west someday And now I sit here and wonder things there must be something in the air On the plains of North Dakota The quiet dreams of California And if they ask me do I have another night I might give another thought And if they ask me, would I do it all again? I might say, why not? I had myself yet another dream. It never quite looked the same. On the wing of that. Plane. Heading out my way And if they ask me do I have another night I might give another thought And if they ask me would I do it all again I might say why not Outside my mother's own house The world is spinning I am spinning too It seems so still And things are buried here You can hear it in my name Every pile of vacant bones Kind of looks the same but they're not singing, ooh, yes, I know something's got to give. 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 Yes, I know something's gotta give. Ooh, yes, I know something's gotta give. Ooh, yes, I know something's gotta give. Ooh, yes, I know something's gotta give.
If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at Prairie Mosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Danback. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.